Tonight on Game Points 386, Nintendo Direct is nigh. Helldivers 2 is doing very, very well. And Elden Ring DLC seems to have some more info dropping soon. All that and more in just a moment. But first, I want everyone here to know this is an audience interactive podcast. So if you're watching live here at Twitch TV or later at any video hosting platform, let me know what you think about the topics on hand. I want to hear your comments, questions, concerns, etc. So that way I'm not just in some random echo bubble speaking only to myself. I want to know what you guys think about these topics as well. First up, though, I want to mention where I've been for the past few weeks. Uh, sick is the long and the short of it. I got a nasty cold. It, re- it wasn't like bedridden kind of cold, but it was enough to keep me from like talking. So I just had to take a couple of weeks off, but we're back. We're going to slowly ease back into things and hopefully we'll go right back to business as normal. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and talk the first topic here from Nintendo itself. A Nintendo Direct Partner Showcase is coming. Watch On Demand via YouTube on February 21st at 6 a.m. Pacific, Jesus Christ, for around 25 minutes of information focused on Nintendo Switch games coming for the first half of 2024 from our publishing and development partners. Stay tuned here. I do expect to have things like Hi-Fi Rush announced coming to the Switch. That makes perfect sense to me. Also, for those of you thinking they might be announcing a new bit of hardware, I'll dial back those expectations just a little bit. One, something like that would have its own Nintendo Direct, in my opinion. Two, there seems to be reports from all across the sector saying that Nintendo's new hardware, whatever it's going to be, the Switch 2 or insert name here, has been delayed to early next year. It's originally slated to be coming out late this year. So, if you're looking for what that's going to be, wait a little bit longer. Now, if you're looking for Nintendo first-party news, I don't think we'll get too much from that here as well. This is mainly based on develop on par- publishing and development partners, so mostly a third-party show. Maybe some second-party stuff, but don't expect like a new Mario Odyssey or anything either. That said, I do expect some good things coming out of this. 25 minutes is one hell of a big chunk for Nintendo Direct, and I'd imagine we'll see some good stuff all coming out before... Eh, August or so with that first half of 2024. So all stuff that is either announced or is getting announced with a very quick turnaround time. Looking forward to seeing more of that soon. I want to move on to a game that everyone seems to be talking about at the moment, and that is Helldivers 2. What we have right here is Steam Database. The link to this and all the stuff we'll be talking about today will be provided down in the description below. Helldivers 2 is doing phenomenal right now. Now keep in mind these numbers are for Steam only, but considering Helldivers 1 only had 6,000-ish players playing concurrently, and Helldivers 2 is at a peak right now, at its highest peak ever, of 457,000 people. Huge. Dwarfing any other game Sony has currently put out, uh... Remember, the first Helldiver is only 6,000 people. This, 457,000. Those are numbers that are bigger than Grand Theft Auto. Well, as far as concurrent players, not over time, not, not all time, but concurrent. It's, it's better than anything Sony's cranked out. It's better than Destiny 2. And that number is only continuing to go higher and higher. And this is, by the way, with Arrowhead, the developers of the game, Putting in a cap of 450,000 players until they figure out their server issue. If they had the server issues nailed, that number would be significantly higher in my opinion. The iron is hot with this game. I hope they figure it out soon to maximize how many people get into it. As I was do, by the way, the blast. It's essentially an unlicensed Starship Trooper simulator. Uh, which has, of course, ignited the stupid Starship Troopers debate online, whether if it's a good movie or not, whether if it's a fascist movie, no one really cares. It's just bub go splat because I shoot them. That's the heart and soul of the movie. And that's the heart and soul of this game. Coming out at an excellent time. No one saw this coming. Uh, certainly not Arrowhead, because their server capacity is not where it needs to be. Although, they're not a huge publisher, and... As I said, Helldivers 1 on Steam, 6,000 players cap. This 450, I think we can cut them a little bit of slack. But they need to get together very, very quickly. 
because you, you got to strike while the iron's hot on this. You need to retain those players. You need to solve the server issues, and Sony should be throwing everything they can to keep those, uh, get those servers up and running. This is what Sony has been looking for with all their live service shit. Results like this. I do think that this means Arrowhead is going to get bought by Sony, by the way. I think with how successful this game has been, I think that there'll be an offer put in for Arrowhead and they will be fully owned by Sony by the end of this. Possibly even within the next couple months, I would imagine. Uh, I, I think that the, this is the kind of live service numbers that Sony wants in-house on the portfolio. There's also a couple news stories floating around about how it was Arrowhead that looked at what Bungie was doing with Marathon and said, eh, this isn't really got the stickiness you guys need. So, kind of fascinating if that report is to be believed. I don't know if I necessarily put too much faith into it. That is kind of a rumor, but it could be interesting if Arrowhead has more pull at Sony than we might think they do. As for the Helldivers game itself, fantastic. When you can play it. Uh, I'm a little salty at the community for not focusing on the, the main, objections, main, main objectives of the campaign. They're off murdering bugs when they should be protected against socialist robots. But hey, play the game any way you want, I guess. Fuckers. Congratulations, though. This, by the way, puts them at, uh, I think, 20th? When it comes to all time, can I, yeah, compare with others. I think if you take a look at all time peaks, this puts them at, yep, 20th. Uh, above games like Among Us, Grand Theft Auto V, uh, Starfield, Counter-Strike, the original, Destiny 2. The only things above it are the things that you would expect. Elden Ring, PUBG, Power World, Counter-Strike 2, Lost Ark, Big Overseas. Uh, Dota 2, Cyberpunk. Hmm. Although there's a few weird titles on here too. Like, what the hell's Goose Goose Duck? Apparently it was popular, but I, I have no idea what that is. Same with... Uh, I know that's really the only one that I haven't heard of on here. But still, a, a surprise listing on there. Everything else makes sense. Uh, except for the like Capcom Arcade second stadium. Weird, but at least I know what it is. But yeah, 20th highest concurrent player count ever, according to Steam Database. So go Airhead. I'm glad you guys are rocking it. Keep the good news running and talk about the fact that we actually have some more information about Shadow of the Air Tree finally dropping tomorrow. First trailer for Shadow of the Air Tree will be revealed in, at 15 UTC. I'm a bad host and didn't bother to look it up what Pacific Standard Time is. <coughs> Excuse me. Still a little sick. But hopefully, uh, by the time you guys see this tomorrow, there'll be a new trailer for that game out. There's also apparently some news that From Software has bought the name Elden Ring from Bandai Namco. Now, that does not necessarily involve them buying the game or all the IP. There's some legalese involved in it. But Bandai Namco, being in some rather nasty financial straits, seems to have relinquished at least some control of the IP back to From Software. The full details of whatever that, is, that agreement is are to be forthcoming. Uh, this it was just recently uncovered, and it's written in legalese. So you're not really able to tell for sure what can be separated from what, what from, Swimwear, from Software actually owns and what Bandai Namco still owns. But it seems like they're trying to at least reestablish some control over the IP. I'd imagine From Software doesn't want a Demon Souls situation where Sony owns the whole thing and they can't do anything with it anymore. We'll see. I mean, one second, I do need to cough real quick. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, that won't be edited, by the way. We do this show completely live, so that's staying in. Uh, still under the weather. My apologies. Possibly the biggest news that happened over the past week was this Xbox podcast, which really could have been an email. Uh, the internet was a bunch of do about nothing, it turned out, as we were all wondering what the fate of the Xbox is going to be, because you had the three biggest names at Microsoft when it comes to Xbox speaking 
on a podcast hosted by Tina Amani. Uh, by the way, she used to work for IGN and now is doing comms for Xbox. It's shit like that that make people question legacy games media, the corporate games media. Because they always end up working for PR, it seems. Be it going to Xbox or Sucker Punch or Gearbox or, or going down to Sony, sometimes Nintendo, going to the Treehouse. There's always something, it seems, right? And that's where a lot of the suspicion comes up about, like, are you really on the up and up? Or, or, or is there something else going on here? Now, does that mean I necessarily, like, have anything against Tina Mani? These people get very friendly with PR. That is part of access journalism. But it appears to be improper. Is it actually improper? Well, I do think there needs to be a bigger wall between, the, between PR and the... Uh, editorial side of things let's just say that but she was the eic i believe of ign for a little bit there i digress i'm going off a little bit of a rant here the whole idea of this podcast was to address the rumors that microsoft might be escaping the hardware business that things weren't doing nearly as well for them that you might see xbox become just a publisher brand rather than a hardware producer and the fan base was up in arms about it for quite a while before this podcast finally dropped meaning to hopefully soothe some of those fears. And it didn't really, at least if you pay attention. See, Phil Spencer, uh, one of the three people on here along with Sarah Bond and Matt Moody, Phil Spencer talks out of both sides of his mouth constantly. He is really good at saying very little while saying a whole bunch. It is 22-ish minutes, I believe, is the timer on that, of almost nothing. Like I said, it could be an email. Some things were brought up during it, though. The whole transcript is below. If you want to go take a look for yourself, I will be putting this link in the description. Uh, first off, I want to bring up, Spencer said, on, said the following quote. So let's just go ahead and tackle the exclusivity question, because I know it's on the minds of a lot of people. We hear from the community, and that's an important input for us. So we made the decision that we're going to take four games to other consoles. Just four games and not change our fundamental exclusive strategy, end quote. A lot of people were panicking, thinking that, like, oh my god, no more exclusives. They're going to be everywhere they want. And Phil Spencer came out and said, those four games don't include Dana Jones or Starfield. Yet. This is what I talk about when he says out both sides of his mouth. Because he won't come out and say... Starfield or Annie Jones will never be on PlayStation. He just says, the four we're bringing over aren't those. And he couches it in such a way to make it sound like, it's just these four. Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. By the way, he refuses to state what those four are, but they commonly be, commonly believed to be Hi-Fi Rush, Pentiment, Grounded, and Sea of Thieves. But the fact that he couldn't even say that on this podcast, it's, it's all... Bill Spencer used to be looked at as like a nice guy, someone that gamers can relate to. He understood how to talk to gamers. People loved him. But I think as the years are going on, that goodwill is getting spent and people are realizing this is a man who at the end of the day is just a corporate suit. And I get it. You don't get to that position without being one. But I think people are realizing they're not, he's not your friend. He's trying to sell you something. And he's done a really good job at being very personable. But he does those half-truth things way more than anyone else I've seen in that position before. He's very charismatic and is able to convince you that he has told you what you want to hear despite not telling you anything at all. And people are starting to get wise to it. Because yes, those four games coming out to other platforms... Don't include Starfield and Anna Jones. Don't worry about it. There are no plans yet to bring those to the other platform. Yet. He says everything out loud, but those other parts, they keep quiet. Or it won't answer questions. And this goes back to the fact that when you have Tina Amani, who once again, no personal animus toward, but she's not a journalist here. She's working for Microsoft. She is part of Microsoft's PR team now acting in the role of a journalist or an interviewer. 
when all these questions, in fact, have already been pre-screened and they already know all these answers. It's a stage play. It's, 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 a, a, it's a shadow play with no form or substance. It's just designed to make you think that a journalist is actually asking these guys questions. In reality, it's just a PR bit. So, four games are coming to other platforms. Likely, but not officially yet, Hi-Fi Rush, Pentiment, Grinded, and Sea of Themes. I imagine that tomorrow at Nintendo Direct will get some of those games announced for sure coming to Switch. Also dropped here, Matt Booty saying that Diablo 4 is coming to Game Pass on March 28th. Awesome. Four games on Game Pass, the better. Uh, when it comes to hardware... They did say that there's some stuff coming up, Sarah Bond, with the following quote here. There is some exciting stuff coming out in hardware that we're going to be sharing this holiday. And we're also investing in the next generation roadmap. And they'll be really focused on that there's delivering the largest technical leap you will have ever seen ever in, ever in a hardware generation. Which makes it better for players and better for creators and the visions they're building, end quote. They say that for every hardware leap. It's going to be the biggest leap anyone has ever seen. Because you can't really define it. And it sounds great. No word on whether or not there is going to be a handheld. There have been a bunch of rumors that Microsoft's working on some kind of handheld device to challenge the Switch. We don't know if that's actually coming or not, but I do believe that that is in the cards, given Microsoft's heavy investment into cloud technology. Because the only way a handheld is really, really going to work these days, if you want like the high fidelity stuff, is through cloud tech. Or you spend thousands of dollars on it. You don't get to make a Switch competitor and get away of putting Switch games on there for Microsoft. Nintendo gets to get away with having, as much as I enjoyed Breath of the Wild, uh, I did finally go through and finish it. As much as people enjoy Breath of the Wild, Mario Odyssey, Fire Emblem, those are not your big budget games like Horizon, Halo, Forza. Gran Turismo, etc. And Nintendo gets a little bit of a pass on it. Microsoft doesn't. They need to deliver current generation graphics onto a handheld. And the only way you can get away with that relatively cheaply is by going heavily into the cloud. Now, if they can drop a device that's mainly a streaming device for less than 200 bucks, uh, that could be something to keep an eye out for. That could be amazing. And that's what I think that they would lean into cloud tech with their handheld. Assuming that they're even making one, I think they are. The rumor certainly is just that. But let me know what you guys want to see from Microsoft coming up. Are they done with consoles? Sarah Bond does mention the next generation roadmap, whatever that might be. Next generation doesn't necessarily mean consoles. It would be handouts. And uh, they did wrap things up saying they have a showcase coming in June. Typical E3 time. Probably some big announcements there. We're going to go to Eurogamer for this next story here. 700 Ubisoft workers strike in France over a failed salary negotiation. Uh, Ubisoft's in trouble. Go to the article itself. Over 700 unionized Ubisoft employees working across the company's French studios have taken part in an organized day of strike action after annual salary negotiations collapsed. The strike organized by French Game Workers Union, STJV, I'm not even going to pretend to pronounce that, it took place on February 14th across Ubisoft Paris, Montpellier, Annecy, Lyon, and Bordeaux Studios. The STJV had a call for action at the start of this month, saying annual salary negotiations had reached an unsatisfactory conclusion. Ubisoft is in major, major trouble. And when you have 700 employees striking, and demanding better compensation, as they have every right to do. Uh, I am less annoyed with uh, private sector unions than public sector unions, like the teachers or something like that. I think those are endlessly corrupt. Public sector, uh, private sector unions, knock yourself out. If you guys want to get a bunch of people together to say, hey, we're worth this much, awesome, cool. You could be worth that much. But also don't be surprised if you all get fired. And Ubisoft is a company in major danger when it comes to financial stuff. Uh, Skull and Bones has gone up like a hot fart. They're not really bringing anything in right now revenue-wise because they have fucking nothing out there. They have nothing coming out later this year that I can tell other than maybe an Assassin's Creed game that may or may not get delayed. Ubisoft is in a very precarious 
position. In 2024 is going to be, if 2023 was the year of layoffs, 2024 is going to be the year of closures. And I do expect a major publisher to go bye-bye. And I think it's Ubisoft. And them having strikes is not going to help that situation. That is not to say that the workers can't go out and try to get as much as they can from the, as much blood as they can from the stone. Sure, knock yourself out. I think it's folly to be demanding pay increases when everyone in the industry is getting fired. I think all that this is going to do is give you a little bit of a better severance package, possibly when the axe comes for you, if even that. Because the way this works now during these times, and once again, I don't want to poo-poo people getting as much leverage in a company as they can. The people that you're working for are not your friends. It should be an antagonistic relationship. You should bleed from them as much money as you humanly can. They are not your friends. Don't work for free. Work for whatever you can get away with. Bleed them dry. But also understand the financial reality of the situation. And when moves like this happen, if Ubisoft acquiesces to their demands, what happens is they go, okay, we'll increase your salaries. And to make up for it, they fire 100 people. And then they take the money they save from those 100 people and give it to everyone else. Which doesn't actually improve the situation at all. Because then they still have to fire people coming up because of the way the, the financial market is right now i get it i get why they're doing it i think it is a misplay the time to do this shit was back when covid was hitting and the games industry was flush with cash not right now but hey knock yourselves out uh, i hope it goes well for you i don't think it's going to Speaking of industry woes, go to Video Game Chronicle for this one. Embracers canceled 29 unannounced games between July and December of 2023. Uh, Embracer Group, of course, everyone's favorite uh, whipping boy at the moment, though they're not the only one suffering massive losses. Uh, I can go on and on and on, and I have, about all studios firing people, laying people off, canceling games. It's just that Embracer group grew so laughably huge, everyone kind of saw this coming a mile away. To the article. Embracer group canceled 29 unannounced games during a six-month period last year, the company confirmed on Thursday. The company announced in June 2023 that it was implementing a restructuring plan which would involve the closure of studios and cancellations of projects. During its first fiscal quarter, which ended in June, it had 153 unannounced games. 153 unannounced games. Of course they exploded. In the development across internal studios and external studios, it was financing. That number fell to 138 in the second quarter and 124 in its third quarter that ended in December. The restructuring also resulted in 138 one one thousand three hundred and eighty-seven job cuts are about eight percent of its global workforce during the six months that ended in December. This included cutting eight hundred and seventy-one internal game developers, two hundred fifty-two non-internal developers, and two hundred sixty-four external developers. As of December, Embracer has lost one hundred and thirty-two game studios, down from one thirty-nine six months earlier, and was working with fifty external development studios, down from fifty-nine earlier. And keep in mind, that's still not enough. Embracer CEO Lars Ringfer said on Thursday that the company's restructuring plan is now entering its final stretch, but warned that more cuts could be coming as it looks to sell off more assets. More cuts will be coming. Because fucking, they, they still have 124 games they're working on. 124. There's no way. There's no way. They can release all that. They're going to whittle that number down by another half before they stop cutting. Because while, while Wingfors is putting on an optimistic smile and saying, hey, 
We're in the final phase, but we got more layoffs coming up once again. This is 2024. It's going to be worse than 23 was. Embracer Group is going to be gutted. Even harder than it already has been. If not collapse in its entirety. And as much as I necessarily hate being the bearer of bad news, we do have some layoffs we have to talk about this week because what week aren't we talking about them? PC Gamer here to talk about Blackbird Interactive's layoffs, unfortunately. Homeworld 3 Studio Blackbird Interactive confirms layoffs due to economic pressures outside of our control. One week after delaying Homeworld 3 until May, Blackbird Interactive has confirmed that an unspecified number of employees have been laid off in the studio. The layoffs were initially reported by multiple former Blackbird Interactive employees on LinkedIn. Blackbird Interactive confirmed the layoffs in a statement provided to PC Gamer, saying the following. Due to economic pressures outside of our control, we had to take the unfortunate step of separating from some friends. This is part of the realignment path that's necessary because new projects that were shelled by some of our partners. We looked at multiple ways of avoiding this and regretfully other options weren't viable. This is why the Embracer shit has a knock-on effect on everyone else. Blackbird isn't firing people because Blackbird was necessarily in trouble. Blackbird is firing people because what they had planned coming up in the next couple years and projects were pulled by other companies that had problems going on. That's why that shit in Embracer matters. Because it has a knock-on effect on so many other studios. Uh, venture capital is drying up. People aren't investing nearly as much in other projects anymore. You're going to see a reduction in games. Probably for the first time in games released in 2024, 2025, 2026. For the first time in a while. Typically there are more and more games released every year. You're going to see that number come back down. It is getting nastier out there not better getting worse hopefully blackberry entertainment survives hopefully homeworld 3 does well enough to where they can keep the doors open but if they're already having to lay people off and the game hasn't even launched yet now once again it's not because of any quality issue of homeworld 3 it's because of other future projects that are getting axed but that's still not good that's not a good look and then finally Joining Blackbird in the uh, layoffs, Disco Elysium dev Zam Um to lay off around a quarter of its staff cancels new game. This is from Good Luck Have Fun, which is Sports Illustrated's uh, video game vertical. Around 24 employees are at risk of redundancy at Disco Elysium maker Zelm, according to Good Luck Have Fun sources close to the matter. This is roughly a quarter of the company's current total workforce. These cuts go hand in hand with the cancellation of a project codenamed X7 which was told to be a standalone expansion for Disco Elysium. In a call with Sam President Ed Tomaszewski, said that X7 was, quote, a game that was one or two years away from completion and could have taken more time and effort than Disco Elysium did. Normally, I would say best wishes to those involved, and best wishes, by the way, to those involved in the Black and Active layoffs. But in this particular case, while layoffs suck, so do commie worshippers who unironically had a picture of fucking Stalin hanging in their office. Praised Marx and Engels when they win awards. The industry deserves your sympathy. These fucking people deserve your scorn. And if you think I am being extreme, fucking Stalin is one of the most prolific mass murderers in history. There is no difference between unironically hanging a picture of him up than unironically hanging a picture up of Hitler or Pol Pot in your goddamn office. And to worship not just at the altar of socialism, but straight communism. Proud Marxists, they call themselves. An ideology that murdered hundreds of millions of people. Now, I'm sure they'll say the same about capitalism, but they have no fucking idea in their heads what things are going about. But these people suck. And while the layoffs across the industry are horrendous, and I have sympathy for a lot of people in it, when it comes to fucking people at this studio, ha fucking ha. I have zero sympathy. In the same way that I had zero sympathy for anyone who would openly praise the fucking ideological, the, 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 the where am I going? <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting heated. 
I have zero sympathy for these people in the same way I'd have zero sympathy for anyone who openly praised Hitler and said that Mussolini had good ideas. Both ideologies deserve to be on the ash heap of history. Fuck these people. So my heart goes out to people at Blackboard, about Blackbird. My middle finger goes up to the people working here. May you be forgotten in this industry. And never get a chance to take any of the spotlight ever again. And that does it. <laughs> that does it for the news, which means that does it for the show as well. This has been Game Points 386. Thank you all for showing up. I do try to stream this every week here at Twitch TV slash Game Points every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, except when I'm horrendously sick. Like I still kind of am. I'm sure you can hear it in my voice, which is already starting to go. So we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. If you like what you saw here, you know what to do. Like, spits, follow, sub, shares. And come on by throughout the week to catch me streaming various things as well. Until next time, y'all stay safe, take care, and I'm out of here.